Welcome to another episode of Jews in the World. I'm Phyllis Simbler Miller, and today I'm very excited about my guest, who is in Australia, author Susie Zale. And I'm always on the lookout for YA books, young adult books, that talk about the Holocaust as a way to reach young people for them to understand, but not to make it so horrific that they turn away without learning anything. So Susie has written a very, uh, here's my copy. Oops, can't really see it with the background. It's called Ink Flower. And it's really very much inspired by her own father's story. So first, let's just ask Susie, why'd you write the book? This was not the first book in which you talked about your father's past, correct? Absolutely, yes. And um, well, I wrote, well, it's a long story, but I'll start perhaps at the beginning. So, you know, Ink Flower is the story of a, a 15 year old girl who finds out the father has six months to live. He's diagnosed with ALS and he has a secret to tell her about um, his life as a teenager in Auschwitz. Um, and really, it's it's a fiction, but everything that um, happens to my fa- um, Lisa's father in the book mirrors my own father's experience and all the lessons that Lisa learns whilst watching her father die are the lessons my father taught me. Um, but the story actually, even though the story has just come out in the US and Canada, it actually started many decades ago and um, when my father was diagnosed with motor neurone disease. Um, and before that, I was I was a lawyer. I was lawyering and um, he came to us back in 1998 and said, you told us that he'd just been diagnosed and had six months to live. And um, I quit basically, I quit my job straight away. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew that I wanted to, to get to know my father. And um, he wanted the same thing. And I think it was within a few days, and again, all of this is kind of mirrored in the in the novel. After a few days, he um, brought us all together. I have two older brothers and my mother, and he said, we are not going to spend the next six months crying. We are going to talk. And the first thing he wanted to talk about was his Holocaust experience that he had kept hidden from us. I mean, I knew he'd been in Auschwitz, but I never had asked what he'd seen. I knew he'd lost his mother and father and one of his brothers. I never asked how. Um, I, I got the sense that he didn't want to talk about it, and it was something that just just went um, went unspoken. But now, of course, he was dying, and it was time to look back. And I think part of it was that he wanted to ensure that we weren't ever victims or or bullies or bystanders. And so we all flew to Fiji to a desert island um, a few months after his diagnosis. And over nine nights, about twenty five hours. He told us his story, he told us about you know, being beaten up as a young boy on a soccer field at school, um, the yellow armband, the cattle train trip to Auschwitz and his first experience seeing death. And I think part of the reason he hadn't wanted to talk about it was because he didn't want that trauma to be our personal inheritance. I think he wanted joy and compassion and, you know, faith and love to be what he'd passed on. He didn't want any part of that to taint our lives. And when he came to Australia, he actually, sorry, you wanted to ask No, I, yeah, what I wanted to ask, what Maria going to say, so um, men, I, I know many survivors didn't talk, but many survivors uh, grew, had their children grow up in a Holocaust survivor community so that there was talk. So did you grow up Roll back a little bit and tell us, so were you surrounded by other Holocaust survivors or not, you know, not involved at all? So Melbourne has a a huge, I think maybe second to possibly Israel, a huge, huge Holocaust survivor um, community. My father actually founded a club um, back in the early, I think it was in the early 70s, called the Theatre Herzl Club, which was just for Hungarian and Czech Jewish refugees, which became quite a big, quite a big um, social club. And yes, his friends, many, many of them were survivors. They became my aunts and uncles, my family, really. But perhaps he chose to surround himself with people that were like him. And it wasn't something they talked about. They were kind of um, joyous and forward looking. My father and probably some of his friends had covered over their tattoo. He covered over his tattoo with a flower because he didn't feel like a victim and he wasn't a number. And he was so 
appreciative of his new life in Australia. He just wanted to give back and he popped, you know, he put it all, shoved it down into a little box and it, he never went there. And um, I don't remember any of his friends really ever talking about it or the people that, you know, I grew up with and who came for dinner. I went to a Jewish school, so I really did grow up in that bubble of community. And, um, and so I learned about the Holocaust as a subject of school, but it wasn't as, um, you know, in a per very personal um, experience. It didn't really touch us in that personal way. But, in, but yet, really interestingly, I always sensed that it wasn't safe to be a Jew. And, you know, growing up and even into my 20s when I was at university, I never told anyone I was Jewish unless they knew me first. So there was something there, some sort of, you know, second generation thing that I thought we were all really strong and positive and it didn't touch us. But yet, I, you know, I ended up writing hot, three Holocaust books. It was something I kept returning to Auschwitz and, um, and eventually my father told us his story. So it obviously did touch me deeply. But growing up, it wasn't something we talked about. So did you really have to prevail on your father at that point when he told you his diagnosis or something just changed in him and he realized this was, he had to do it? Well, I actually read somewhere while I was doing research for this current book that it often takes um, a trauma for many survivors uh, to suddenly feel that they want to share. And I think that was a diagnosis. My father knew he didn't have long, and I think he finally felt a responsibility to tell us what happened so that we would pass on that story because, you know, we very quickly decided that um, – we were, I was going to write down everything he told us. And, and in that small time in Fiji, we had, you know, we had the old clunky, was back in the 80s, video recorders. We had a dictaphone. I was scribbling notes. At that time, I came home and I had them all transcribed and kind of edited them up just as a version for the family, really, initially. Um, my father printed copies, gave them to all his friends. We had a beautiful um, launch just for all his friends before he passed. Um but it was the night before he died and we were all, he was still at home, mum was caring for him. And I remember we all had time alone with him to say goodbye. We knew we'd be losing him in a matter of hours. And he he could not, he had a tracheostomy, he could no longer talk and he, but, you know, he could, he was, his intellect was fully there and he could communicate with, with his eyes. And I remember being next to him and I, I guess I just wanted him to leave with a smile on his face. And I said in, in those last hours, Dad, I promise you, your book will be on bookshelves in bookstores and people will learn about the Holocaust and they will learn that those last years um, don't have to be frightening and they can be time of, of great growth. And because my father, he just, he lived that time so bravely and graciously and deepened his relationships and it was just an incredible time. So I knew I had two stories to tell. One was my father's Holocaust experience, which was, you know, as they all are, so many lessons in that story but then also I wanted to tell the story of how his dying changed our relationship and how much you know how I learned so much from him in those last years and so um I, I had made Dan my promise that the book would be on bookshelves so after he passed I actually wrote an adult memoir called The Tattooed Flower which was these alternating stories of the, my father telling his story and then living with him through the five years he, he eventually lived with the disease. Um, but then fast forward 20 years later and I'd, I'd written 12 books, but I kept feeling drawn back to that story. And I think it was that fear that I talked about and that sense it wasn't safe to be a Jew. And I felt like, you know, I, I was angry about what had happened to my father as a child and I was scared. And what do you do with all that fear and anger? I think you know, revenge is nice, but change is better. And I suddenly felt like, well, who better to write for than teenagers, you know, who are still trying to work out what sort of world they want to live in and what sort of people they want to be. And so I started um, adapting the true story um, for a teen and young adult readership. The one thing that surprised me in this story was that she didn't tell her friends that it was Jewish. And I'll tell you why it surprised me. Because I grew up in Elgin, Illinois. It's a town northwest of Chicago, in which frequently I was the only Jewish kid in my classes. And I and my closest friends knew I was Jewish. I didn't like go around and 
But that fear of, t of anyone knowing, I must tell you, I had a hard time relating to it because it's I couldn't so understand desperately not wanting anyone to know I was Jewish. It's so interesting because I went to a Jewish school, but whenever I was out of that situation, whether it was tennis lessons or any extracurricular activities, I didn't, I actually didn't tell anyone I was Jewish. There was this kind of deep seated fear. And I thought, well, maybe that was just me. And so I actually interviewed a lot of um, people that had gone to public schools, non Jewish schools. And many of them told me the experience that it just wasn't something they brought up, they didn't talk about. And, um, you know, eventually, obviously, when they grew up and they got older, they did, or perhaps they felt they were, um, you know, met a few other Jewish people in that same environment and, and confided in them. But a lot of them said the same experience, which is very interesting. I mean, this is back, you know, in the, in the 80s. And I don't know, we just didn't own who we were. We were, we were... I was very Jewish in terms of we went to, you know, synagogue for all the high holidays. We celebrated all the, you know, Passover and all the events, big family meals. Every Friday night we had Shabbat. But out in the world where I wasn't safe in my own little environment, I, I kept it to myself. And, yeah, a lot of the people I spoke to related to that. And I guess it's also a larger narrative about, you know, teenagers just wanting to fit in. And that is whether – in any way that they might be different. I think that's something that a lot of kids relate to, that they don't want to be under the spotlight. It's just something. And this character, Lisa, not only does she really want to, because she's not religious and she they don't live um, at all a traditional life, but, you know, she also keeps the secret that her father has died because she do, doesn't want to be the kid in the corridors who they're pointing and whispering to. Poor thing, you know, her father's dying and he went, you know, he was a camp survivor. And, you know, I was 32 at the time when my father was diagnosed and it took me three weeks to tell my best friend. And there was something about speaking the words out loud that would make it real and I just didn't want to say the words out loud, my father is dying. And that was part of it too, I think, trying to, I don't know, deny it in some way for as long as I could. And so I just, I suppose, uh, expanded on that with Lisa. It doesn't take her a few weeks, it takes her a few months. What's been the reaction of young people, people in your target market uh, in age-wise? Because lots of adults it's, also read YA. But young people, what have the reaction been when you've spoken? I know you've toured with this book, correct? So what's yeah, been the reaction? I speak, I speak at a lot of schools as well, and it's been just, especially during this difficult time after October 7, it's actually been so heartwarming to see so many students and not just Jewish students, but just across Australia, really takes the story and messages of like, you know, just feeling for this character and understanding how she feels and learning about this whole, you know, this uh, a religion they might not have known a lot about, but also the there was a Children's Book Council of Australia Awards recently and the book was chosen as the winner by students, not by the judges. It was shortlisted by the judges, but students across Australia and remember, the Jewish community is very small in Australia. So this is, you know, just a broad swathe of students who voted as their favourite book. And I just feel like if you can reach people and they, you give them one character to care about, pretty soon they are next to that character. And it doesn't matter if the character is Jewish or not Jewish or black or white or they understand that our differences, you know, are no more. We sort of bound more by our similarities than our differences. I guess what I'm trying to say. And if we can get children to understand that, I think it's just so valuable in how they will act in a schoolyard, you know, will, will they stand up for bullies? They read these stories and I hope it has some impact. Is Holocaust education currently mandated in Australia? It is in many states, which is just fantastic. Um, I don't think it's down to the detail of how many lessons you have to give. And I think some schools will only be, you know, they're only allotting three maybe three lessons to the holocaust which really doesn't touch sides but you know it is mandated we have an amazing holocaust museum in melbourne another one in sydney every state um has one in australia and they do a lot of education a lot of school groups go through the holocaust museum and have a you know really deep dive um and hear from survivors we still have a number of survivors here guiding so 
we there's a lot of education, but I still think, you know, we always need more because the lessons. Oh, and I this, and I think making it personal is very important. So I think so. I, I think sometimes, you know, history books can be a bit numbing for teenagers and the number six million a bit overwhelming. But if you yes. give them, you know, one carriage, it can you can really touch them. Yeah, and my thing, I, I'm not down, I'm not being negative about Anne Frank, but the problem with Anne Frank is that, uh, you know, the diary doesn't go to the camps, so that it's a more rosy picture of being in hiding. And so yeah. an ink flower, you you kind of lay it out pretty well. I mean, start just, you know, briefly, your father grew up in a small town in, I call it Czechia now, the Czech lands, Near Prague, not near Prague. Just tell us a little bit. Well, he lived in a small village called Porubka, and there were maybe three or four families that were Jewish in that community. And um, he, so just very few Jews, and all of them, they were going through a hard time already when he was a very young boy, and they would just hide in the classroom. But he was insistent. He wanted to play soccer, and he went out every day and got beaten up every day. Um, he was quite a, a tough little guy, but, you know, it, it hurt him deeply. He had no friends. The Jews thought he was dangerous because he insisted on going out there and the non-Jews wouldn't um, would either not talk to him, ignore him or, or beat him up. And then, of course, you know, his family are rounded up and he goes to Auschwitz um, where he is, you know, just by luck, um, a fellow inmate whispered to him as he was going through the selection queue, stick with your father, don't go with your with your mother and younger siblings. And he stood on his father's shoes to be a bit taller. Um, and it was when his his turn to go through, he just ran past Mengele, past all the guards with guns and just ran and hid amongst the group of men slated for survival. Um, he, he was very small, but he managed to, uh, he was put to work in a mine collecting, you know, I think, rocks out of coal um, and survived by the kindness of strangers and luck and his own grit, all of those things, um, and then came to Australia. How did he but come to Australia? I was going to say, like, how did he come to Australia? I've heard stories about how uh, Jews after the Holocaust. So how did he get to Australia? Uh, I don't he, mean he on a went, plane or boat. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. he was offered um, safe passage to America which was always his dream as a, as a young boy to live in New York. I think he had an aunt, but he said to himself, I have to go back to see if my any of my family have survived. I can't, I can't do this. So he went back, um, found his way back home. Of course, another family was living in his house and told him they just wanted to see the back of him. No one took him in. And he said, I'm just getting as far away as I can. Um, so on his way out, um, he actually did find a few of his siblings still alive and for a, small, a short time they lived in Czechoslovakia. Um, and then communism happened and my dad said to himself, I can't do this again, I'm not going to be told how to live and that I can't be a Jew and, and, and practice my faith if I want to. And he escaped um, the usual story, went through lots of DP camps and eventually um, got on a ship to Australia as I think a 19-year-old orphan with not a, a penny and built you know, a beautiful big life here. Did he speak English when he arrived? Did he prepare himself by learning English or did he know English? Yeah, he did. His siblings were very against him going to school, so he used to secretly study um, in his bedroom by torchlight under the blankets, um, put him through, himself through um, school. This is uh, after the war. This is after, after the war. Yeah, he put himself through school without any assistance from his siblings in, in secret, in fact, taught himself English. I think he, you know, by the time he went for the interviews to see where he could be placed, um, he already has like six languages under his belt. Um, you know, he was smart and he, he planned it. So he had learned enough English that he ended up being a spokesman on the ship for all the refugees. And when he came into the, the camp in Australia called Bonagilla Refugee Camp, again, he was the one that always translated and um, so he did. He did speak not fluently, but enough English to to get by. But your mother is uh, was born in Australia, correct? No, no, she was Hungarian. She was born in Budapest, and very lucky, lucky. You know, Budapest was left to last um, by the Nazis, and so she managed to sort of be shuffled between you know aunties' homes and country, and 
um, and managed to stay out of the camps, she ended up um, escaping communism too as a 17-year-old by herself um, through the dead of night escaped, made her way to the same boarding house as my father where they fell in love. Um, so that was a very a lovely story to hear from the, my parents. But they spoke, they didn't, they didn't speak Yiddish, right? When they, had they spoken no. Yiddish? My father, one of his six languages was Hungarian and he spoke to her in Hungarian. But for the first days of coming to Australia, she's, you know, bought a little dictionary and she walked around with this little dictionary under her arm. She was very determined as well and learned the language um, pretty quickly and got a job. And so they, when I was at home and they were supposed to speak English as their first language and Hungarian as their second language. My father never spoke Czech again. It was it had too many terrible memories, and so he only spoke English or Hungarian. Did did you learn Hungarian? I I, I suppose I know how to speak kitchen. They call it kitchen Hungarian, so I know you know the, the sort of language they used at home about food and, and very simple things. So I have an ear and I understand it, but I actually, for some reason, never wanted to speak it. And again, I don't know if that's just a young, stubborn teenager you know, just not wanting to know a foreign language. You know, if it was nowadays, you'd be wanting to speak as many languages as possible. But back then in the 80s, I just, I didn't want to. And so I understand, but I'm I'm not very adept at speaking, which is a real shame. I regret not, not being around people who spoke other languages. You know, you, I live in Los Angeles now, and you know how many people know so many languages, and I know English. Yeah. I mean, I've tried to learn other languages. It's just not in my wheelhouse. And it's very hard when you're, as you get older to pick up. But the perfect time is when you're young. Right. When then my grandparents all came from Russia and Latvia and stuff, escaping the czar, they were determined that their children would speak English, even though they barely mm -hmm. spoke English. And so that was a time in America when you didn't want to pass down languages to your children that were foreign languages. And interestingly... I mean, we all got Hebrew names, which we used at school, but yes. um, my parents were European and they called, uh, you know, us Susie, Gary and Peter, which are such vanilla, you know, names that would obviously never be questioned. So it was, you know, that sort of a little flying under the radar, getting in and making this new life for yourself, um, kind of free of the past. It sort of reverberated in different ways. What do your bro what did your brothers think of the book Ink Flower? Yeah, look, they loved it. We we all read it. We actually went on a family bonding holiday, so sort of full circle from the time we were in Fiji hearing the story. We all went away together. Uh, I think it was to Bali and everyone and now there were obviously there were grand you know, children and grandchildren too, and everyone was reading the book and there were a lot of tears, a lot of smiles. I think it was you know, any opportunity to kind of remember the people you love and talk about them is wonderful. And and it's interesting because they read it and this was my perspective. You know, they obviously had different perspectives, but it was a kind of nice thing for, the, for us to go through together and revisit it. And I asked them for lots of stories that fit into the book as well from their memories because they were older than me. So it was, yeah, it was a beautiful experience. And it was 20 years um, when it was published, 20 years since my father had died, and so it felt like a beautiful tribute. Uh, so today, what would you tell young people about hiding their identity? What would I tell them today? I would say that our differences are what make us interesting, and if we, and I think that's something we should be proud of and we should own. And in fact, when you do tell people your deepest, darkest secrets, often there's not the reaction that you think it's going to be. And I think especially at, at this time, we need to be proud. We need to show people who we are. And that's not just being Jewish, but that's all the values we hold. And if people, if we are more open with people, then they're going to be more understanding. I think that's, it's hard at the moment, but I think it's really important to talk about our history and our heritage, to remember it, but also um, to move forward with the sort of values our parents wanted to impart on us and all the, the things that our relatives held dear. And I think we have so many wonderful um, values and traditions that it's something that we, you know, I, I, whenever I've explained Shabbat to a non-Jewish friend, they've been completely envious. And one of my friends actually said, I'm going to start Shabbat myself. 
we just have such beautiful family traditions and such a closeness to our community and each other and support, especially, you know, you can witness it this time, that I think it's something to be so proud of. See, that's how, that's how I think why I told people I was Jewish because so they could, I mean, most people in the United States, we talk about big United States is, have really mm -hmm. never met, knowingly met a Jew. And I yeah. think that it's important to say, we look like you, we talk like you. And, and I'll never forget. I was um, at uh, getting an MBA at Wharton of the university of Pennsylvania and a teammate, who I knew was Catholic. So I said, I'm going to not be here because it's Sukkot or some Jewish, I think it was Sukkot. And um, I said, we're Jewish. And she said, oh, does your husband have those? She meant pay out. And her only idea of what a Jew yeah. was, was from the chosen. So that's one of the things I think it's so important for us who didn't grow up in Jewish communities or who find ourselves not in Jewish communities to explain, no, not everyone looks like that. Because otherwise, really, Books can be really helpful, like Ink Flower in talking about the Holocaust, but unfortunately, really good novels. I mean, I think The Chosen is a really good novel, but it, it's very one-sided about what a Jew is. Yeah, and I think just like any community, we are so many things, you know, and the way we practice our faith is just varies hugely. But I think it's not just to show that we are the same as you, but I think to move beyond that to say, and in the ways we are different is the beauty. And let's share each other's differences and learn about each other's differences and see the value in that difference rather than let it frighten us, you know, and try and push it away. So I think it's, it's a bit of both. Yeah, I was studying for an exam at Wharton and two of my uh, teammates in that particular project helped us put up the sook at the same time that we were studying. So it's really good to explain and have the opportunity Absolutely. To share traditions. And I now have a very good friend that I'm an online writer who is a, a Christian, a, you know, a, a, I would say a practicing Christian, if you know what I mean. And she wishes me uh, Shabbat Shalom by uh, email every Friday. And it gives me such joy. I can't even explain that that she's cognizant and she just loves doing it. She finds little pictures to send me. And I think that sharing is really important. Yeah, I think that's the magic of books. And I think that's why it's so important, particularly for young adults, to read stories about people with wildly different lives. And actually, kids love that. They love to be dropped into an environment which is completely foreign, both physically and emotionally. You know, and we don't give teenagers enough credit. We were talking before about you know, having material that can be quite confronting and frightening. And I think that's what kids actually look for. They don't just look for books that make them, you know, laugh. They look for books that make them cry and think and question. And there are ways of doing that. I'm Like my father, when he told us his story, I also, you know, sort of take great pains to protect my readers from the graphic detail. I think you can do that by kind of mining your character's internal world. So how does my character feel about what she sees? rather than having to paint a graphic image of what she sees. There are ways to protect your readers, but at the same time trust young adults that if they're not comfortable with any of the book, they can put it down and they will stop reading, you know. But many of them actually look for books that can help them grow and learn. And, you know, I think novels are an empathy machine, so it's such a great opportunity to give our teens and young adults books like this in which they can learn and understand and, you know, completely change their stance on what they thought a Jew was or really anyone that's different. So the book is available on Amazon, is that correct? And yeah, and also any it should be available in all U.S. bookstores, or online from any site and as an e-book as well. So it, it shouldn't be too hard to find online or in store. Okay. And... In closing, is there anything that you think we haven't discussed that you'd really like to say to the listeners? I think all another big lesson of the book, because my father had ALS, and that's also quite a big theme in the book, is um, is about those those last years and what it's like also caring for a parent or a family member who's unwell, and that there's, behind every disease is a person, and behind every person is a story, and so. 
you know, it's never too late to ask questions, you know, of our parents, of our grandparents, because they really have um, incredible stories to tell and one day they won't be there. So that's one thing I hope people take away. And the other main one is really celebrate today. You know, my father had a beautiful way of doing that. Every time he lost some functioning, you know, when he could no longer swallow his food, he said, you know, I can still, I can still smell it. Or when he could no longer walk, he would say, I can still sit in my wheelchair at the top of the stairs and watch the grandchildren run up after, you know, after kindergarten. They can throw their arms around him. So I think, you know, there's there are a lot of lessons, really positive and hopeful lessons like that. I think that's the other thing about young adult writing. It can't be a dark and unrelentingly sad story. You need to have moments of light and joy and hope. And I'm always very careful to thread that, you know, through my books. And so just the way my father lived his life, um, and even those last years, so full of love and curiosity and joy. So that's that's kind of an important lesson to me too as the flip side to the Holocaust chapters. Yes, so for, uh, the readers, the book goes back and forth. So her format is you're right there when it's hap what's happening to her father and then you're in the current story of the teenager who's learning about her father. And I would highly recommend this book for uh, book clubs, bo adult book clubs too. <laughs> I have a daughter who belongs to a book club, adults who read YA and they read YA books. Because oh, yeah, so it's really blurring the line now. I've had I have as many adults as young adults reading the book, which is interesting. Yes. So, uh, but in or using it in schools, and again encouraging students to talk about their lives and about things that might make them uncomfortable and they wish other people would have empathy. So I think that's the most important thing that probably comes out of Ink Flower is the need to have empathy with the other, whether the other is someone who's sick or a different ethnic background or just has different political opinions, not talking politics here yeah. when, in a week before the U.S. elections. Uh, I'm just saying... We have yeah. to remember to be civil and have empathy for other people. Yes. And respect each other's choices. Yeah. So I thank you so much, Susie. This has really been delightful. I thank my listeners. And please, always remember uh, to speak up against anti-Semitism and other forms of hate.